Okay. You can turn the homeworks in here if you have them. Uh, otherwise, you can turn them into my office uh, if you're using late days for this one. The uh, next homework is going to be due, as I said before, on, sorry, it's going to be out on Thursday and then due um, the last day of class, which is three weeks from this Thursday. So you have, week, you have extra, an extra week to do it, but you also have um, the Thanksgiving break in there. We're not going to have class the Tuesday, uh, next Tuesday. So we can say we're, there's no class. Um, you can use late days, I'll ask this, you can use late days for the last problem set if you want to. Again, you know, no more than five total for the whole class. Um, but you can use them for the last, for the last uh, problem set if you want. Uh, but you can't use them for the final project then. Just, we have to get the grades in at a certain point. So you have to submit those the, the day that they're, they're due. Um, are there any questions about sort of the logistics of the last few weeks of class? All right, so today we're going to talk about what we've been talking about so far has been deterministic systems. So we talked about linear, nonlinear systems, observable, partially observable, uh, fully observable systems, differential algebraic equations. But the <clears throat> kind of overriding assumption on all of these systems was that they were deterministic in that given the current state and control, We are given the next state at time t plus 1, this is in the discrete case, discrete time case, um, is just a deterministic function of xt and ut. So it equals that exactly. And if we just knew this real function, and actually I guess what we're assuming mostly we do know it, um, so what we're assuming is that if we know the current state and the current control, then we can determine exactly what the next state is. And we, in fact, we can determine not only the next state, but as many states in the future as we want, right? Because we can keep just putting in more and more controls u, and we'll get, you know, this gives us xt plus 1, we can get xt plus 2 then, by just plugging into our function xt plus 1, and then whatever control we want, ut plus 1. So the basic idea has been that we, we know this, and this determines the next state exactly. However, in a lot of systems, this is not really a good model to have, right? Because a lot of cases, you have these great big systems. And I guess on some level, you could argue whether these things are really stochastic, you know, if you knew the exact state of every, of every atom in the system, or whether they're just sort of stochastic in our approximation. But clearly, um, a lot of systems, when we represent them kind of using our, using the, state that we know about, there's going to be some noise, right? There's going to be some extra terms or some extra um, additional term here that means the next state is not determined exactly by this current state and control, right? There's some additional noise term. And this could really, it's sort of a philosophical distinction in some sense, what counts as noise, right? Because this could be the fact that you believe that there is genuine noise in the world, right? You could just believe that, um, the world is stochastic and it evolves stochastically. You could also believe that if, for example, you have a prediction of the future, that prediction could just have some uncertainty around it, and that could actually also be captured as a stochastic, as a stochastic element of a system, right? Say so you forecast what demand is going to be in the future, that's going to be a, a variable that will affect your state, of course, because like in power flow analysis, of course, the loads will determine what, how the system will actually evolve. So if you forecasted these loads, then there's still a sense to which we don't quite know exactly what they are, right? We just sort of, you know, can, can we have our best guess of it, but maybe we don't know exactly what they are. And so that also captures this element of stochasticity because we do not anymore sort of have this knowledge that this state evolves deterministically like this. Yeah? So, um so right now I'm saying no. I'm, I'm putting up a general model here. I'll talk in a second about special cases of this, of course, because you want to actually define a little bit more than just this. But the basic model for a stochastic system 
is to say, in the, and this is in discrete time. In continuous time, it's actually even a little bit more complex. You have to get into stochastic differential equations, and we don't want to do that. Those are kind of just nasty notation. They're not actually that bad. They're just a lot of notation. Um, but in discrete time, we're going to say that the next state is given by this same function of the dynamics here, f of xt ut, plus some noise term epsilon t. Where importantly, epsilon t really can take on, it, we, you know, we haven't talked too much about probability in this class, so I'm, I'm going to sort of talk about this at a high level. Shoot. Um, hang on one second. Forbid this from sleeping. So we haven't talked too much about stochasticity, um, but I'm going to use these terms kind of informally here, again, with the assumption that you might have seen these things before and have some uh, idea of what these are. But essentially, oops. but essentially, the current state, next state equals the current from function of the current state, the current control plus epsilon t, where epsilon t is a zero mean random variable. And what that means is, on average, an expectation, this has value zero. So if we do this a lot of times, if we could get the exact same state and the exact same control many times, and we see what the next state is, and we, and we average these all together, then on average, it will be f of x t u t. That will be the mean value of these things. Right, but this is a very general model when, because so so just and just to say if, if the mean is not zero by the way if the mean was something else, then we were better just to include that something else in the dynamics itself because that is sort of that's what's called a bias of our of our model we're missing by a certain amount so we just want to include that in the dynamics. The noise term captures has to be zero mean, but it can capture really any arbitrary type of noise in the system right, and it could depend and it's actually fully general. If it depends, if this can depend on, so this should be state and control. If epsilon t could depend on both the state and control, this is a really extremely general model. We're not saying anything about the distribution yet of it. We're just saying this is some zero mean random variable that captures the noise of the system. And this, broadly speaking, is, is, is a stochastic system. Are there any basic questions here? Because we're going to get into a little bit more uh, specialized cases in a second, but um, does, this, does this sort of make sense to everyone? Okay, so the tricky part with nonlinear systems, or so, sorry, general stochastic nonlinear systems, and when the noise is arbitrary, as I said before, is that <clears throat> these issues of controllability and observability and how you control these things become even more challenging than they were for general nonlinear systems. Right? We already said those are really hard questions to answer for a nonlinear system. We had to essentially do it by Newton's method, for example, to determine what the state was given a um, sequence of observations, maybe in a, the partially observable setting. And for control, you know, we can't formulate general nonlinear problems as convex problems. So these can be tricky. right? Um, in stochastic systems, you have this other problem, which is, even though the noise is zero mean, you still, after sort of putting a little bit of noise through the dynamics again, it actually might create non-zero mean effects. And all I mean by that is, even if the expected value of this noise term is zero, so let's say, that we have this thing, right? So xt plus 1 equals this. Say we know xt and ut, right? So we can't really know what xt plus 1 is, but we can know the expected value of it, right? The expected value of xt plus 1 is just going to equal this thing, right? Because expectation is linear. You can take any two variables and sort of this is not a random quantity. This one is, but it has expectation 0. So the expected value of this thing is just xt f of xt and ut. The problem, though, is that if you do this one more time and look at this thing, expect the value of t plus 2, 
this does not equal f of xt. Sorry, it does not equal f of f of xt ut ut plus 1. And the reason is, you can't, this thing, or rather, the, this next state, xt plus 1, is not just equal to that, right? It's equal to that plus a noise term. And once you put the noise term into a general nonlinear function, you actually don't have this quantity anymore. This does not hold. And what that means is, even the expected value, even if you just want to you know, maximize the average case state, or look at sort of what the average state evolution will be, it's hard to even compute what that is. Because actually even computing this thing for a general distribution is, can be arbitrarily hard. Now, again, this is not the focus of the course. We're not actually talking about uh, stochastic systems for the most part. We haven't covered a lot of probability. And I think to really understand these things, you have to look at them from a really probabilistic perspective and, and sort of understand all the laws of probability before looking at these things. So I'm not going to go into too much detail on any of this. Um, you should just know that when you have general nonlinear problems with stochasticity, or, or sorry, nonlinear dynamics with stochasticity, you have all the same problems you had for deterministic nonlinear systems, right? You can't optimize it with a convex problem. Maybe you have to use Newton's method or some non, something that isn't guaranteed to converge to, to estimate the current state. Um, and even more so now, we can't even compute what expected future states are going to be. So there's just sort of a lot of problems that come up when you talk about stochastic systems. And in fact, the overall feel of stochastic control is a really challenging one. It's a really hard um, problem. And some of the problems in, in this setting are, are really, we still don't know how to solve them. Uh, we still don't know how to solve them tractably with computers, I'll say. Because these distributions of what, what epsilon is just get really, really hairy and it just becomes very, very hard to do it. Should get rid of that little guy down below. It's staying up for some reason. Okay, so now again, just highlighting one case, and I'm not going to um, talk in detail about this, but just like we did for nonlinear systems, and we said, look, there's a special kind of nonlinear system where, sorry, <laughs> a special kind of system, namely linear systems not nonlinear systems, it's a kind of, kind of dynamical system, where we could do a lot of these things exactly, right? We could, in linear case, talk about observability for partially observable systems, right? We could infer what the past states had to be from observations. Again, assuming the system was observable, which were those rank conditions we talked about last time. And we could also control it, because we could formulate the control problem as an optimization task. And just like that was sort of a nice case of general deterministic systems. The nice case for stochastic systems are what are called linear Gaussian systems. And these are linear systems. So we have to go back, we have to stay within the linear model, right? Otherwise, we don't have any of those other facts. Like we can't know that the system will, uh, you know, we don't have compact ways of writing control problems as optimization problems, for example. Or rather, we don't have convex ways of writing them as optimization problems. Um, and similarly, in the linear Gaussian case, a lot of the issues with stochasticity, the problems that came up due to things like this and actually some other issues as well, the fact that you can't oftentimes take integrals really over, over these distributions to figure out what these values really are analytically, um, a lot of those problems go away in the linear Gaussian case. And this is one of sort of the, the few cases of stochastic control tasks and stochastic dynamics where we really can compute control solutions very, very well. The basic idea here is that 
as in the, in the deterministic case, we have a linear system. And you can make it an affine system too, I should say. It could have an extra constant term there, but I'll, I'll just ignore that. That doesn't change any of the math, actually. So the linear system says xt plus 1 equals axt plus but, as before. And then in the stochastic case, we're going to add this noise term, epsilon t. Where, very importantly, this is a Gaussian random variable. And in particular, it's what's called a multivariate Gaussian random variable. So actually, who here has seen Gaussian random variables before? Gaussian distributions? It's by a raise of hands. Hands? Okay. Who, who's seen multivariate Gaussians? Okay. So a multivariate Gaussian is actually quite simple. All it's saying is that we have uh, so a multivariate Gaussian, remember, this is a vector, x, t, plus n, is a vector in Rn. And when you think of Gaussian random variables, you usually think of just single random variables, right? That's what sort of a single variate, uh, uh, single variate Gaussian is. The multivariate Gaussian is the same thing, but it's just you take many different independent Gaussian random variables. I should make this like hat or something. So each of these is an independent Gaussian random variable. In fact, in this case, it's going to be with also with mean zero and unit variance. So it's just a standard normal distribution. You take a whole vector of these and you multiply it by some matrix F, some fixed matrix F. And this gives you some new quantity, which we're going to call epsilon. So this is now a, right, F here is going to be a n by n dimensional matrix. And we just multiply it, this thing, by F, and we get a random variable. If we want to generate another random variable, we sample more of these guys, multiply it by f, and we get another sample from there. Um, this is, the notation we use for this is that we say that epsilon t is normal, in this case with mean zero, because if we added something else to it, then we could have some mean, but with mean zero, with not variance, but covariance, um, f transpose f. So don't worry about this, um, but all this, this, when people talk about multivariate Gaussians, they're just talking about this. They're talking about a, a, a bunch of single Gaussians, but then you multiply by a matrix, and essentially the covariance, which is this thing here in the notation, that's just this matrix times its, times its transpose. So if you see this notation, if you say people, you see this saying that Epsilon is mean zero with some covariance sigma. The way you actually know what this really is, is you find some matrix such that, some matrix F such that sigma equals F transpose F, and then you construct it that way. That's all, that's all a multivariate Gaussian is. Again, this is, the only time it's going to come up in this whole class, so don't, don't worry about this, this won't be on the homework or anything, but just if you haven't seen it before, um, you may see other definitions of this. You can also define it in terms of its actual density itself, probability density. Um, but this just sort of makes clear the connection with, with single variant Gaussians too, that it's really not that much more complex than them. So that, that's an aside. I'm not going to worry about that. I have one slide on these things, so, and then we'll, uh, then we'll move on after that. So. Now, what's nice about the linear, and linear Gaussian case in particular, what's nice about Gaussians in general is that a lot of these expectations you can compute analytically. And there's a lot of very nice rules for how these distributions change when you iteratively apply different operators to them, like linear operators in particular. Um, but a very nice factor here is that unlike in the case of a nonlinear case where these expectations did not propagate through. So we couldn't even really compute the expected value of xt plus 2 
because we had to sort of funnel our noise through a nonlinear function. In the linear case, for some pretty simple reasons of, of probability, this no longer happens. And actually we can propagate expectations, not actual values, because there is some noise still, remember. Like any, any particular set of values that you get by simulating the system will have some noise on it. But if you think just about the expected value of xt, this is actually going to be, um, it's going to obey these rules here. So maybe let's, we'll just go sort of go through this and show the difference between this and the nonlinear case. So here, x d plus 1 is defined as this thing here. So I guess I didn't quite, that isn't quite even the, the most important uh, element there. But we can take expectations here. And as before, you know, these things are not random quantities, so they all just drop out. And so all we have is that this is expectation of this is xt plus b ut. Now let's do it for the next one as well. Let's look at the xt plus 2. This equals, remember, it'll be uh, a squared xt plus, actually I won't write it like that, I'll write it like this will be a times um, a x t plus b u t plus epsilon t uh, plus b u t plus 1 plus epsilon t plus 1. Right, and what's nice now is that four linear systems this actually holds for any linear system. It doesn't have to be a Gaussian random variable, but there's other things that are nice about Gaussians here. But for linear systems, when you take this expectation, and so, the, so, so this you can distribute out again, and so this is the expected value of this thing here equals the expected value of a, a, x plus the expected value of a, b, u plus the expected value of a epsilon t plus expected value of b u t plus 1 plus the expected value of x, or sorry, epsilon t plus 1. And what's very nice about linear systems is because of linearity of expectation, um, this term here is actually also going to be 0. So this one cancels out too. So all you have are the this is equal to zero. This is actually the more important part. I, I actually didn't. I meant I should have written one more thing here um, to really make this make sense because it really is the fact that you can not only take for one step have your expected value of your state be just the expected value of this linear system. But they actually take that through many, many times. So this also equals, by the way, that this is just equal to a squared xt, because all these things are not stochastic here, plus a b u t plus b u t plus 1. And the point is, this is exact. This is the exact expected value here that we can compute because the system is linear. Because it's Gaussian, we can actually go even further than that and actually compute the actual distribution of this thing. So this not only is zero mean, but we also it also actually ends up being a different normal variable, right? We're taking some a here, multiplying it by epsilon t. That's going to be a new normal random variable. So a epsilon t is a new normal variable again with mean zero because we're not changing the mean at all, and with covariance, um, it'll be f transpose a transpose a. Sorry, the other way around will be uh, a transpose f transpose f a. Because all we're doing is we're taking that and we're multiplying it by something. It's how we constructed Gaussian random variables in the first place. Um, and so the same thing happens. And so in fact everything here both stays computable and in fact we know the exact distribution of this thing. More than just knowing its expected value even. So th that's kind of an aside. If, if you haven't seen this before this could be kind of confusing. Um, don't worry about it too much. Just know that we can do this, and in the linear Gaussian case, 
the nice thing is that everything stays linear Gaussian. So the expected value of the state at time t, we can compute the expected value of that, and the fact that that variable itself, the state at time t plus 1, is itself a Gaussian random variable. And these things sort of just stay, everything stays linear and stays Gaussian. So everything's very nice in this sense. I'm going to erase it because I don't want people copying it down too frantically because, again, this is just sort of a, kind of an aside. Um, it's useful to know that this is a special case, but we'll, and we'll come back to it a little bit in terms of control, but it turns out that for this setting, uh, control is oftentimes very easy. And we won't prove this, uh, but what it turns out, and this sort of makes sense given this discussion here, right, is that when you talk about optimal control in stochastic systems, you have to maximize something, right? You can't know what the next state's going to be, so you have to do something like maximize the expected cost or things like this, right? Because the cost is also going to be random variable when states are random variables. Um, and for a Gaussian, linear Gaussian system, the best strategy actually is just to ignore the noise entirely and just proceed as if it was a non-stochastic system, do the exact same control, you know, controls optimization, we're going to talk about some other types of control you can do, you know, starting this class and then moving on forward. Um, but the point is that that actually ends up being not only a good strategy, but actually the optimal strategy in a lot of cases on linear Gaussian systems. And that's why they're kind of nice. You can almost ignore the fact that they are stochastic and just proceed as you would otherwise. Um, one little note is that this also applies to the partially observable setting. So we can also have a setting where both the state evolution here is stochastic. So we have some noise in the, in the state evolution. And we also don't observe even an exact function of the true state. What we observe is some function, you know, some limited function of the state. This is what is a partially observable linear setting we talked about before, where we could compute all those things like observability and whether we could or not infer what the state was from past histories. But here, instead of actually even observing some true function of the state, we observe this plus some noise. So now we don't even know sort of what the true observations were. I mean, <laughs> rather, the observations, we know them, but they aren't even true deterministic functions of the state anymore. And so in this case, the, you might think that things like observability will become a lot harder, right? Because now you don't really know, well, what's the, you know, we, before we sort of wrote down an exact equation, right, of what the state had to be, the initial state had to be, in order to see those different things, right? It looks something like this, right? It was something like y1, y2, uh, to yk. Remember, this equals... Uh, C, and then C A, and C A squared, so that down to C A K minus 1 times X 1. Right, this is, this is assuming that we're not taking any control action, we're just sort of uh, not, not, not putting any input in. The next state, which is evolved according to this state times A, so the sequence of observations is given by this linear equation here. Um, in this case, it doesn't do that anymore. Right? But you might also think that like, okay, well, you know, we, maybe we can't find something that, that makes this work exactly. Let's do something like minimize this error though, right? Put a big norm around all this and minimize this over x1. Okay, that would be sort of like finding the state that was sort of most likely to generate all those um, points in kind of a least square sense. Um, and it's not quite this. It's actually a little bit more subtle than this because the actual noise you get for each of these points depends on um, both just, not just this thing, but also this noise term. So you, know, you might have a sense in which uh, subsequent measurements might be more uncertain, right? Because You've added noise a lot more time, and so they might not tell you as much about x1 as, as earlier measurements. But something very close to this, which is a little bit of waiting on this thing, 
is actually what's known as the Kalman filter. So if you've, seen, if you've heard the name Kalman filter before, all that is, is that is just the way of determining what the states are given a sequence of observations in a stochastic, partially observable linear system. And the common filter is actually the optimal way of doing this in some sense, which I won't, which I won't define. It's essentially the probabilistically optimal way of doing it. It gives you the best estimate you could, you could hope for. So that's what the common filter is. And it's very similar to just this, where you just have a sequence of, of uh, observations. You want to estimate some initial state, and you construct some least squares estimate of this. It's just a matter of weighting this and a matter of actually computing it online, as opposed to doing it sort of all given the whole history. That can be kind of inefficient. Okay, yeah. So you're saying you, can't, you couldn't do, uh, you can set that equal to uh, that thing earlier because of the uh, error. Right, yeah. So, so we wanted this to be equal to this in the, discrete, in, the, in the deterministic case, right? So ignore these for now. Um, the problem is, here you have all those extra noise terms. So you're probably not going to find a, and remember there are a lot, there are potentially a lot more outputs here than there are states. I mean, before we didn't matter because they'd all be consistent, right? Because we knew the system was deterministic, so we could just pick any n of these rows, compute this thing, and, and have that be equal. I guess you, you could do the same now, but it's not guaranteed to give you the true x1 anymore because there's noise on it now. And so this is no longer equal to that, just by definition here. y is not equal to c times x. And in fact, x2 is not equal to a times x1. There's noise in all these things. So these are not going to be equal anymore. So what you might want to do instead is say, well, you know, maybe the ex in, expe in expectation they're equal, right? This is the expected value of y equals that. So let's just sort of take some sort of least squares approach to this, right? Where we try to minimize the difference between what we observed and what we would expect given x1 here. Um, and, and it gets, it, there's a lot of subtleties here. I should mention, because of what I was talking about before too, right, where later, later observations are going to be less indicative of the current state x, or the, the, sorry, the original state x1, because we've added more noise in the meantime, right? We sort of added more in these noise terms, so we've kind of built up more noise. So if you see, you know, yt really, really far in the future, that's going to tell you almost nothing about what x1 was. Whereas in the deterministic case, it would. In the deterministic case, that would be a very good sort of, uh, you know, that would be a very helpful thing in telling what x1 was because you know exactly how these things evolved and you know it's deterministic. In the stochastic case, it's not true anymore. And so you need some other kind of least squares like method to determine what the states are given the observations. And the common filter is the solution to this problem. Not an approximate solution, it is the exact solution to this problem. We're not going to go over it at all, but just know that that's, that's what that thing is doing. If you hear a common filter before, it's just doing this. It's estimating states from a bunch of observations. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about today, before I go on to control, is, and I only have one slide, and I'm not even going to give any examples. We'll talk about a few examples later when we talk about actually doing control. Um, but just like linear Gaussian systems were, in sport, were an important special case of stochastic systems, because we could solve them tractably, right? Another very important special case is something called a Markov decision process. Um, now MDPs in general, also called MDPs. Now MDPs in general are completely general descriptions of a stochastic system. They are actually the exact same thing as, as saying this, as saying that xt plus 1 equals f xt ut plus epsilon t in the general case. 
The difference is that people usually talk about MDPs when we have a discrete number of states and a discrete number of control actions. So I'm using n and m to talk about the number of states in some sense here, but the number is something different here. Um, before, our state were real value numbers, right? So the state was something like a temperature in a room. We would say, for all intents and purposes, that that's a continuous number, right? And the state at xt was, say, equal to a single real valued number. Now that is already an infinite number of states, right? Because the state can take on any real valued number. Another case is when states really do have some number, some finite number of states that they can take on. Or values they can take on, sorry. Um, so imagine a case where the state of a breaker box, right, was just which uh, circuits were on and which were off. Or just think of it as, in fact, as a single relay. So if we had a switch and our state was a switch turning on and off electricity, then the state could just be, is that thing on or off? This is now a discrete state system. If we wanted to include the heater state in our heating example, we would have one state variable that was discrete and one that was continuous. Right? And you can come up with all sorts of different combinations of these things. In an MDP, the number, I mean, in, in general, as I said before, MDPs theoretically are just completely general descriptions of stochastic systems. The entities that are actually used in practice to make these tractable are typically times where we can actually count the number of some finite number of states and some finite number of controls. So we're going to kind of from these being from these being general things in R n, T e and R m, and we're using different notation here. We're saying instead that X T no, it's not n-dimensional, it just takes on one of n values. 1 to n. Or, u, uh, or ut. So that's not a requirement of MDPs, but that is the case that they're almost always used in. And so we'll just define them here as that's what an MDP is. Some finite number of states and finite number of, of control actions. Now a common thing to do, if you have a relatively small real value state space, for example, say we just had you know, our heater our, our one room example of temperature, right? Where temperature was our state and our control input was the heater, but we could turn the heater, it may say between 0 and 1. 1 would be fully on, 0 would be off, but we could also turn it on in intermediate values. A common thing to do then to transform this to an MDP would be to actually take these values and discretize them. So we take x, which say goes from Say, you know, we don't care about the temperature of a room when it goes below 50. We're just going to assume it's always above 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Or we're going to assume it's always below 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So the best way of representing temperature, of course, is just as a discrete number, or sorry, as a continuous number here, what it actually is. But you could also kind of take a bunch of bins like this, right? And sort of say, well, I'm going to say that whenever temperature is between 50 and 55, I'll call this state 1, uh, 60, state 2, 65, state 3. I actually get this right, the number of things. That would be amazing. But I don't think it probably is. No, it isn't. It'd be like there. Um, so, so we can do that. And now we've transformed this continuous state variable into a discrete state variable. The problem is this is not an exact transformation, right? And when you have things like xt plus 1 
equals some multiple of k times xt plus some other multiple b of ut. There are cases where this is in the same bin here, well, you know, two different states in the same bin here, given the exact same control. So according to MDP, they're the same state, but they're really two different states. You give it the same, con you know, same control input, and they actually end up in two different bins, just according to what state it actually was in. So just the, the high level here is this is a significant approximation, but it can be, can be nice. Now, one thing to keep in mind, though, is that when you have states that all depend on each other in your real system, this can quickly lead to a whole lot of states in your MDP representation. Because essentially you have to look at all possible different values the state could be in, right? So suppose that x, our first, we had four rooms now, and remember in the four room example, all these temperatures affected each other because they just diffuse with each other. So we have to sort of know not just what one temperature is, but what all of them are. Um, in order to represent this as an MDP, you have to actually say just we have two states here. You don't just have two times k or two times n states. You would have to have actually n or k squared states, right? Because you have to be able to represent, you know, the all cross products of this state being you know, state room one being in state one and room two being in state one or room, so let's try to draw this in. So there are three buckets to each of our states, right? So we can be either um, 50 to 60, 60 to 70, or 70 to 80. Um, we need to know not just what one is, but actually what all these three states all, all, what all sort of possible pairs of these states are. Um, so now we have not just three times two states, but we have nine total states. Because this is room one, room one, and room two. And so we have to know what the state is, sort of the cross product states is for both of them. Similarly, if we have three rooms, then we have three cubed. And so the number of states in an MDP representation, and this, this is the only point to take home really, is that the number of states n here in the MDP representation typically grows exponentially. If we, if we discretize kind of in the normal way, it will grow exponentially with the dimension of our continuous state representation. Now, the benefit though is that we actually can represent pretty much in this discretized way, we can represent really any stochastic dynamics we want to, any distribution any dynamics, any way the state evolves, any distribution in terms of what that distribution of, you know, what that epsilon term was, we can represent any of them. And the way this is done in an MDP is through what's called a transition probability matrix. Um, if we have m total actions, then what the transition probabilities say is, suppose I take action i, or actually, I guess I should say, here I'm using k. So suppose my current state, xt, is equal, I use i there, is equal to i. And my action, control input, is equal to k. What these matrices say is this says, gives a probability distribution over being in every single next state. So what's the probability I'm going to be in state 1, given this? In my next state, what's the probability I'm going to be in state 2, state 3, etc. So for any j, you can just define the probability that t plus 1 equals j, given this thing, given that your current state equals state i, and your next state equals, or sorry, and your action equals action k. So it's really kind of explicitly saying, right, this requires, you know, n different numbers here because you want a number for each different j. You need a number for each different current state, so that's n squared, times the number of actions you have so that there are n squared m total entries here that give you every probability that you want to know. 
And finally, there's also going to be, like in normal control tasks, there's going to be some cost function, or people also call it a reward, but a reward is just negative cost that will take a current state and the current action and output some real, real valued number. And we'll see if we have time later in the class. Not sure we'll get to this, but if we have time, what we'll see is that you actually can solve these control problems in an efficient way as well. Now, when I say efficient here, it's important to know that I'm talking about efficient, sort of polynomial the number of states and polynomial the number of controls. Because MDPs might need a whole lot of states or a whole lot of control actions to reasonably approximate even a linear system, this can be actually be still a very large number, so they cannot be very efficient. But as long as a number of states, a number of discrete states, a number of discrete actions are, are reasonable, you can actually compute the optimal control for an MDP as well. And we might see that later. The, again, the take home message here is just, it's really just two things for this slide. One is that MDPs are general representations of stochastic systems. But the second is that to accurately approximate a, a reasonable, reasonably dimensioned stochastic system, you will need a huge number of states, and they aren't always tractable for doing that. Okay, so that's how much time we have left. So this is all we're going to talk about now for just the dynamics of the systems. And now we want to talk about the next step, which is, okay, we've talked about a bunch of systems, dynamical systems. Um, let's go back to control now. Remember, control was we want to pick inputs to optimize some objective. And the paradigm I used for control, this is on, the, on that first slide, or the first set of slides, was what was called optimal control, which the idea is you talk about some cost that you prescribe to the system, and you pick control actions subject to dynamical system constraints that obtain you know, low cost, that do well on, on this objective. And so now we're going to sort of shift gears from just talking about this. And, and, and at first it was very simple systems, right? We just talked about you know, one-dimensional systems. Now we've covered a lot more detailed systems. So you know about things like you know, general linear systems that have high dimensions, high dimensional linear systems. You know about partially observable systems. You know about dis uh, differential algebraic equations for describing systems. You know about stochastic systems. There's a lot of new systems we have now, and so now let's go back to control and talk about, okay, we have these systems. How do we pick these control actions U? Right? What do we choose for those to actually accomplish our objective? Not just for you know, a simple one-dimensional case, but for more complex cases as well. So, So now let's get to control, and this will be the, we'll have one more set of lecture slides after this kind of bringing everything together, but this is the second to last set of, set of slides that we'll go through. No, oh, they're not, oops, keeps doing that, keeps doing these slideshows automatically. Um, and the majority of, of, of our discussion about control is going to be focused on this paradigm of controls optimization. So we actually want to get away from kind of handcrafting rules for the use. So let's, let's just talk about our, our problem again from a high level. Remember, our problem is we have some dynamics. x t plus 1 equals f x t u t. And we'll eventually come back to the, to the stochastic case. But let's just think about the deterministic case, the deterministic case for now. Remember, x is what's sort of given to us. u is what we can choose. We can, in fact, choose a whole lot of u's. So we want to sort of high level. And, and we also have some, some cost function, which sort of says for a state and for a control, um, what is the cost of this thing? And what we want to do is we want to choose 
a sequence of controls, say, I, mean, I should say, right, so the sequence of controls, say 1 to t, to minimize the sum from t equals 1 to t of these costs. That's our control problem. And this was, this was on the first set of slides too, but I'm just sort of rewriting it here as our general task. Now, we're going to mainly focus on this setting of control optimization, but the first thing I'm actually going to talk about is the opposite of this <laughs> in some sense. Um, so control, op th th this sort of name, this, this kind of paradigm here goes by the name of optimal control. And it's, it's very, very old. It's sort of a lot of the technical... I mean, it's been around for, for much longer than that, but a lot of sort of the technical foundations were developed in the 60s. Um, and this is sort of the 60s, um, sort of the modern uh, perspectives on this came around in the 60s. So this has been around for a long time, even this formulation. Um, but before that, and kind of in conjunction with that, there's also been this sort of other way of doing control that people usually talk about when they talk about control. Or not usually, but they often mean when they talk about control. And while this has a lot of names, I mean, I think that the, the basic idea here goes by the name of something called PID control. So the idea that is that, I think that the big idea is that instead of doing this, sometimes, maybe let's just sort of try to determine what UT should be as some function of XT. Sorry, I shouldn't use F here because that's dynamics. I'll say some function. Uh, h of xt. Let's just try to pick that, what that function is. It will end up that a lot of sort of the optimal control formulations end up getting back something that looks very similar to this. But let's just ignore that for now and just say, look, you know, control isn't that hard, right? If we're in a room and we want the temperature to be at a certain point. Well, if it's below that point, I'm going to turn on the heater. If it's above that point, I'm going to turn on the air conditioner or turn off the heater depending on what the outside temperature is like. Right? And this doesn't seem that hard. Okay, it seems pretty easy, in fact. And this basic idea it goes by the name of I mean, a lot of things, but I think a formal definition of a lot of these things goes by the name of PID control. Who here has seen PID control before by a raise of hands? Or just nodding? Anyone? Okay. What PID control does is it says, let's just pick control actions. Look, our, our goal of control in some sense, even though we're making it more formal later on, our informal goal of control is, is say to, you know, get the system to a certain point, right? We want to keep the room at a certain temperature. That's our goal of control. So the simplest kind of control is, well, if we're too hot, push it down, and if it's too cold, push it up, the temperature. And this is a very simple intuition here that is actually quite powerful, though. So to give a more concrete example of this, um, and that will sort of motivate every bit of this PID control. For, actually, first of all, I should say PID, what it stands for is Proportional Integral and Derivative Control. Um, you'll see what all those terms mean in the next few slides. But these are the, it's, just, it's just by the name. And what it is is that function that I, I just erased there has a component that's called the proportional component, has a component called the integral component, and a, and a component called the derivative component. And so it goes by the name of PID control. Um, and despite the fact this is very simple, it's actually used more than you can even imagine, really. Uh, so many things use this kind of control. Uh, and in fact, don't use the more intelligent kind of optimization-based control that we're going to talk about. When we talk about the smart grid and sort of these big energy systems, these l start performing a little bit worse and they start getting harder to, to tune in some sense. But they can work really well in a lot of cases. So to, to motivate this problem, I'm going to go back to this setting of uh, a generator. And in fact, for first, a single generator. 
right? So a single generator, I wrote this, this on when we we're talking about differential algebraic equations. I'm not going to talk about the algebraic part here. I'm just going to talk about a single generator spinning where P electric here is just some um, other set of, I really don't like this little pop up there. Uh, P electric here is just some external electric power that we have to match with our, with our control power. So the system is the state variables, I should say, actually, are theta, the voltage angle, omega, the frequency. Remember, our generator outputs a voltage equal to the cosine omega t plus theta. And the way the system evolves is just by these differential equations. So theta here is really talking about the, the phase angle that will be constant, you know, you know relative to this, this rotating frequency, say 60 hertz in the US. So if we're going faster than that, then our, our sorry, I just keep, said phase angle, I mean voltage angle here. If we're going faster than um, 60 hertz, we'll start pushing that forward. If we go slower, then we'll start pushing it backwards. Right? So again, if it's big, the derivative is positive, so it will increase. If it's, this is smaller than that, it's negative, so the phase angle will, voltage angle will decrease. Um, likewise, the dynamics of the generator, uh, just say the, the um, rotational velocity, omega, is equal to some con, you know, one over some two times some kind of h, which is the moment of inertia. It just sort of t means how much inertia does this thing have. If we take all, take, you know, stop putting any power into it whatsoever, it won't stop immediately, right? It has some momentum. How much will it keep going? That's determined by this physical constant here, which we call h. u is our control input. That's just how much power we're putting into it. And then we subtract off the electric power from that. Yes, of course. Uh, I mean, omega here is the state, and this says what's the der derivative of the state as a function of the state. So what this is giving, this is giving x dot equals a function of x and u. This is a continuous time dynamical system. And suppose our goal was to maintain the system at a zero voltage angle. We can probably imagine that this isn't, doesn't seem that hard, right? We know that we have to keep this at the reference voltage. Sorry, sorry, not the reference voltage. Is it keep omega at the reference frequency? Right, so this thing better be equal to that. And omega is going to change unless u equals p electric, right? So we better put in mechanical power equal to our electric power. That will make, that will keep a constant rotational velocity. And that won't, won't change the phase angle there, or the voltage angle then. So let's take our first, our first shot here, right? Pretty simple. Just set u equal to p electric. Do that always. And, well, if things look good from the beginning, they'll probably stay good, right? So if you already, at the beginning, have a zero voltage angle and you're spinning at the right frequency, then just keeping that same input keeps everything sort of as it should be. Unfortunately, what if you aren't at the right initial starting point? So what if either your initial theta does not equal zero? Well, in that case, you're never going to change it, right? Because in that case, you're just, you know, you're, this thing which evolves at will, you're not going to change this. This is say that, and, 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 say, and say at first, actually, even this is the, the reference frequency. So that stays zero. This stays the reference frequency. So this theta does not change. So if theta is a voltage angle of one, it's going to stay a voltage angle of one. And our goal is really to not only you know, keep things where they are, 
but it actually also maintain them in a certain spot. In fact, it's even worse, right? Because what if when we start, our frequency is not the reference frequency? Well, you know, again, this is going to be just equal to that, so this doesn't change. It stays below the reference frequency, and theta just starts decreasing or increasing linearly. So here's a plot of what happens. This is a plot of what happens when everything starts at a good location. And here's a plot of what happens when things start at a bad location. So here, the initial omega is a little bit below the reference frequency. So this red dotted line here shows omega minus the reference frequency. And the blue line shows the evolution of theta. So this is just low, lower than that. And because of that, theta just starts decreasing. So that's probably not a very good, good control law, right? Because if we ever get a little bit off, we'll never get back to where we wanted to be. Um, and systems certainly like this do not you know, immediately start at the exact right conditions. You know, if we start at the generator, say, for example. Um, so it's really, you know, this is clearly not, just, just putting, setting this to be just the electric power is clearly not a very good control law here. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, so let's try one more thing now. So just putting, I'll, I guess I'll, I build this as, as time goes in the slides too, but I'll just say it here. So, okay, so our first guess was we're going to set P to be just P electric. And that wasn't, that wasn't all that good. So let's try something else. Let's say, well, look, if, if, we want to keep theta at zero, right? So if theta goes below zero, let's put in a little bit more power to get theta, you know, speed up everything, and get theta back to zero. If theta goes above zero, then we kind of tune things down a little bit. We maybe put in a little less power. So you know, I want to say more or less. I mean more or less than this. So we'll we'll still put this in. We'll still put the actual p-electric power in. Um, but let's also put some more in, right? So let's put something that depends on, well, if our desired theta is bigger than theta, we want to put in a little more power, right? That means theta is too, so this, so this would say theta is too small. Our desired is bigger than that. Let's put in a little bit more. So let's just put in this plus this term. In this case, theta d is zero, but I'm just going to write it in terms of, uh, Sort of the general equation of what you might, how you might want to control something. Because like a temperature set point may not be zero. So just like temperature, right? My heat is two. My temperature is desired set point is higher than my actual temperature. I put in more, more heat. Plus, let's try this, right? Let's now, there's no reason for the units here to be the same as the units here. Um, and in fact, you might want to sort of scale. I mean, there's no reason why you want to just have this be one, right? Why have it should, it should be one times this? Um, it can really be kind of anything times this. So let's just put some number here that we multiply by. And this term here, well, actually, I should, you know, I, I, this is in the notes, actually, but I should just mention it. So Kp, all of these terms we'll add in are called gains. And Kp is called the proportional gain. So this is the proportional, this is the P part of our system. And it's called proportional because it is proportional <laughs> to our error. So you put in a control signal that's proportional to your error. So if we have no error, remember, if, if this, this still works in this case, right? Because if we have no error, then theta will equal theta d. And so this term will be zero. And so this whole thing will be zero here. So it doesn't affect us in the kind of the good case. But maybe in this bad case, it'll make things a little bit better. Because we'll now, if we're, if we're going too slow, we'll push ourselves back up to start doing better. So any guesses what's going to happen here? 
Who thinks it's going to work perfectly in this whole, this whole, actually, so, so who thinks this will eventually, maybe not very nicely, but it will eventually make um, theta equal to theta zero and stay at theta zero? Show of hands. Who thinks it won't do that? Who, think, who thinks it won't do that? Okay, so everyone but two people abstain, so. Who, okay, okay, so raise up hand, and you have to pick one or the other, right? Who thinks that it will keep, this, this, this law like this will push theta to zero, I mean, clo you know, clo or close to zero, and it'll stay there. So I show my hands. Okay, who thinks that it will not do that? Okay, so here's what happens when you do this. You get something like this. Again, starting at this situation here, it's better, right? So we're doing a little better than this, clearly. And I tell say that the only reason it's doing this is because there's no natural damping of the system. If the system had some natural kind of resistance to change, it would go to zero and stay there. But the problem is, you're low, right? So here, here we're, we're um, you know, below our reference, up until here, we're below our reference, theta. So here we keep putting in more and more power. You know, keep, keep putting power. That, even if we're willing to play a little bit more, and so this is just the, the formula I wrote over there, that will keep bumping up our frequency. All right, so our frequency is going to keep bumping up higher than the reference frequency, because that's what kind of really is affected by power, right? Really power is immediately affected. Sorry, re re really what is immediately affected by increase in power is the, the frequency of the generator. That starts speeding up to the point where this creeps up to zero. At that point, there's no error anymore, but we've already sped up our, our generator. So it takes a little while for it to slow it back down to the reference. And so in the time, it's, it's increasing more. And you get this very sort of typical oscillation pattern where you essentially overshoot, right? You you start trying to get to there, but you can't. But you know, you by the time you're actually there, you sped the system too much to stop quickly, and you just keep uh, sort of keep going. Now, what's interesting is you can actually by tuning this really high. You never want to do this in, in reality, but basically, you by making this gain here really really big, you can actually get closer. To actually, it's hard to see here, but I think this, this should be a little bit a little bit closer, um, on average, to to the zero value. Uh, but your but in fact your um, frequency is doing even more sort of ups and downs. So basically, in order to uh, get this close, you have to make it so kind of sensitive that you're you know increasing frequency hugely back and forth, back and forth, just to maintain this in sort of a little band. Which is a horrible idea for a real generator, of course. I mean, you couldn't do this for a real generator. You have to be putting in you know, huge amounts of power to do this, right? Because so, this is saying your power you put in is equal to some proportional thing here. And if you have a really big gain here, what it would say is put in a whole ton of power, which you can't actually do. I mean, you're limited eventually. But this is just in sort of the theoretical case where you could put in infinite power if you wanted to. You could get this really close to the value. But unfortunately, you'd only be doing that by swinging the, the frequency wildly back and forth. Okay, so this by itself is, is sort of not that good an idea. And I should say, it does work sometimes. Um, and it works sometimes because uh, sometimes there is more natural damping in a system than this. There's no friction in this sort of ideal generator, for example, that I'm putting in. Usually you actually would have things that would sort of resist change. You, you have a force that would resist change in, um, resist change period in the frequency. And, and that actually would then, this would then converge to, to theta. But in the case where there's no friction, this, this will always oscillate and just keep oscillating. So what do we do instead? Well, in a way you could think of it, well, you know, as I said, well, I just said that I could do a clue because I said if, if there's friction in the system, this can kind of work. So let's kind of simulate friction or even a little bit better. The problem here in some sense, was that all we sort of were trying to do was keep one of our two variables around its desired amount. And the idea is, I mean, this 
if it's actually at its desired amount, right, then, then and theta is sort of constant at zero, then the reference will also be constant at its desired value, right? It has to be constant. So what we can do additionally is add another term here, which penalizes, and I'll write the general case here, but I'll also write what it actually comes down to, which is called the derivative term, and this is KD is going to be the derivative gain, so maybe you're seeing where the PID stuff comes from. Um, and what this does is says, let's look at the desired change in theta. For that, this is good, for, for our case, it's going to be zero, because in general we don't want theta to change. But if you had like a trajectory, you want a theta to follow, maybe this would actually be non-zero at times. So let's take the desired velocity of theta minus its actual velocity and add that to our control as well. Now in this case, this thing here equals zero. And this thing by our definition, remember our dynamics give us definition for that, this equals omega minus omega ref. So we're actually just sort of being proportional here. It's sort of like a proportional gain on omega. But what we're really doing in some sense is actually putting a derivative gain on the thing we want to control which is theta. Does this make sense, what we're doing here? Yeah? So why, do you, uh, why is that equal to zero? Uh, um, because we don't, th this term here is the desired velocity of theta, the desired theta dot, and that should be zero because we don't, we want theta to be equal to zero, meaning it's not changing. So the idea is, um, I mean, you can motivate it in a, in a few ways. This, the, I think conceptually what, what, what you're saying is um, this term here, look, if, if and in fact, I'll just, I'll just go ahead and say, maybe I'll just let this be zero. So l l let's just take the case where we don't want this to be changing. Because theta dot d is only non-zero if you actually want theta to be changing. So if you want theta to say follow a sinusoidal pattern, then, then maybe you have some non-zero theta. But um, let's just leave this out and make this zero. One way of looking at this is that we are essentially discouraging theta from changing very much, right? So if theta is, if theta, the derivative of theta is positive, right, we subtract some quantity. So if theta is growing, we say, wait, wait, don't, don't grow too much. Don't, 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 don't go too fast. If theta is, is constant, we don't let this affect anything here. This doesn't factor in if theta isn't changing. And if theta is decreasing, we say, you know, add a little bit more control. What you can think of this is that this is actually uh, equivalent to adding a little bit of uh, viscous friction to the system. This, this, sorry, viscous drag actually is what it really is. Um, so what essentially, it's sort of just slowing everything down. Basically saying, look, our problem here is we had this thing where we're, you know, oscillating back and forth like this. Um, the problem is that, you know, we sort of just keep, as long as there's any error at all, right, so, so here, as long as there's any error at all, we just want to keep on increasing our, our power, you know, keep on putting in some power when it's like that. What this is instead is, look, if this, if this starts changing too fast, also penalize that. Keep it from changing too fast as well. <coughs> so when this is changing a lot, it'll apply a force that resists that changing. And in general, the general form, which you might see, is that this is... Um, theta dot d minus theta, but really it's because oftentimes we want to keep theta at a fixed value, this will often be zero, and so we can simplify this just to some uh, term times the actual derivative. And again, in our case, this derivative just equals the difference between um, omega and the reference omega. And that is just from our dynamics themselves. So that, that's just because of, the, of these dynamics here um, that we can simplify to this thing as well. Okay, so now who thinks that this 
will get us to where we want to be. It will, it will take us to theta and we will stay there. Or, you know, very, very close. So by a show of hands, who thinks this is going to work? Okay, who thinks it won't work? Okay. So why, uh, I, I, won't, I won't bother asking why. <laughs> I, I, I got some hand raises, that's good, I guess. <laughs> okay, so here's what happens. So it works. So we do, in fact, here is with some gains, uh, kp equals 100. That means we sort of put one gain here. We put another gain here. Um, you can see different gains make a big difference here. So I'm keeping kp to be 100, changing the gain on the derivative. Um, that makes it go a lot faster. But you know, this, in both cases, is the error, both either theta or the that minus reference. Um, and it works. Yeah? Yeah, how can you pick the pyramids of A and uh, Right, okay. So here, this is the art of PD control. And this is why, or PID control. And this is actually why um, there is a lot of benefit to this idea of control optimization beyond this. So what we're doing here is we're just saying, okay, I just, I sort of know what P does, right? P kind of forces it to the, the rather forces theta to the desired point, and d kind of slows it down. So the more d I have, kind of the slower system will be. So, so I can kind of push it up, right? And the more p I have, the faster it'll get to that point. Um, and so just there are a couple ways of doing this, but intuitively what you usually do in practice is you sort of say, okay, I'm just going to guess some. If it doesn't get there fast enough, you turn up the p knob. If it then starts oscillating around the end, you turn up the D knob, and you have these two knobs, and you just sort of turn them around until you get the, the what's called step response that you want. It's when you, you know, you have some, you're at some stage, and you want to go to another point, so you're taking a step in your desired place you're trying to get to. Um, what does that look like? And there is a whole books written on how to pick these. And I mean, the, the, there are both. There are both ways of doing it, kind of um, just heuristically. There are ways of doing it mathematically, and then in fact, there are for for these kinds of systems and for systems that are a little bit more complex but still linear, there are all sorts of mathematical tools you have to to sort of visualize what these things are doing. Um, so if, if you've ever heard of pol uh, pole zero plots, these are essentially plots in a complex plane that plot the eigenvalues of the linear systems in question here as a function of what these gains are. And you can see, I guess, that there's the pull zero plus is just a plot of certain things in the system there. Um, but what you can do is you can actually see how changing these things will evolve the poles and zero. Uh, don't worry about zeros. The, the poles are sort of what is stable in the system. So you can sort of see exactly how you're going to be stabilizing these things. And there are all sorts of methods. They're called things like root locus methods um, and things like this that sort of actually talk about how you can visualize the effect on stability in your systems and the step response of your systems as a function of what those gains are. Um, and, and you can write equations for how these things, for, for, for what the roots of these equations are and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think that I mean, it, it's sort of very valuable for getting an intuition on how these things work, um, but it's also un important to understand the limitations of these things. This is talking about PD control in, in fact, those exact methods, those methods are exact for linear systems. You can approximate nonlinear systems by linearizing around certain points, but they're exact for linear systems. Um, and, it, you know, it's, it's oftentimes very unclear, sort of, when you're, when, when you're not, maybe you don't have a perfect model of your system, maybe you don't sort of know exactly the situation you're going to want to be able to handle in the real world. Uh, so so there, there are limits to um, the value of, of a lot of these tools, I think. But they are a huge, um, there's a huge amount of literature and just bodies of work on essentially how you pick gains like this. So, that, so, so the short answer is you, you tune things around, you sort of tweak it. Uh, the long answer is you can read any number of books on how to do this. Yeah? 
It's going to be dependent on the starting conditions too, right? The behavior? Yes, absolutely. Um, so if you have a bigger step, and if you expect to take bigger steps, then you might want more aggressive gains or less aggressive gains, things like that. I mean, so, so we're out of time here, so I apologize for going over a little bit. Um, but essentially, if you, if you have a system where, um, because this is all proportional, if you get far enough away, you, will, you, can, give, you can prescribe arbitrarily high control, right? Um, and this can cause some big problems, especially when that control is not achievable. So there, you can, I mean, basically you could do things like clip, maybe that'll work, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Um, things happen. Okay, so this, this, this looks like it works. So the question is, why do we need the integral terms in here? Um, I'll get to that all next time. I'm also talking about this in multivariate settings. This is sort of a single generator. What about when we have many generators? Does this still work at all? Um, and in fact, if it does work, what's the benefit of this control and optimization paradigm? So we'll start talking about that next time. Okay. <laughs>